So welcome everyone to this second video uh, conference of the Animal Welfare Intergroup of the European Parliament. First of all, I would like to thank you all for joining us. My name is Anja Hasekamp. I'm the president of the Animal Welfare Intergroup, a member of the European Parliament uh, since 2014 uh, for the Dutch Party for the Animals. And together with Reineke Hameleers, director of Eurogroup for Animals, I will be hosting today's meeting. Before we start, I would like to set out today's agenda uh, and some housekeeping rules. Please turn off your microphone during the session unless you are given the floor by myself or Reineke. This will prevent disturbance and background noise. Today's meeting will be recorded and can be reviewed afterwards uh, on the website of the intergroup. There will be no interpretation today, unfortunately, so all those who wish to intervene are invited to speak in English. I'm so thrilled that we have th uh, uh, three uh, experts with us who will provide us with a better insight in the role uh, of uh, non-animal approaches in COVID-19 related research. And after each presentation, we will have a Q&A session. So if you want to take the floor uh, or have a comment, please use the chat box and Reineke will monitor. We also invite all of you who are following us uh, through Facebook Live to post their questions online. You can do so by tweeting a question and adding the username of the intergroup. It's at AW Intergroup. We will make a selection of those and Reineke will come in and pose those uh, questions to the experts. I can already inform you that the next animal welfare uh, intergroup meeting will be dedicated to the publication of the farm to fork strategy and the biodiversity strategy who will be published today. Uh, and they are both essential components of the European Green Deal. They will be also very crucial for animal welfare and conservation related policy making during this term. And the European Parliament will write own initiative reports on these two strategies. And I'm very happy that several uh, vice presidents of this intergroup will be involved. As uh, several colleagues have asked about the follow up letter of the last intergroup meeting, I want to inform you that the draft has already been prepared. However, we wanted to dispatch the letters after the publication of the EU bi biodiversity and farm to fork strategies. These two strategies will provide helpful information on how to find the best ways for a new course to fight, uh, fight zoonotic diseases from wildlife trade and consumption and intensive livestock farming. Now it's finally time for the main topic of this meeting, the role of non-animal approaches in COVID-19 related research. Our first speaker today is Professor Thomas Hartun. He's director of the Center for Alternatives of Animal Testing, uh, CAT, at the John Hopkins University. Professor Hartun will talk about the power of animal-free test methods to better understand, prevent, and treat this disease. He will share with us his work and the actions of the Center for Alternatives for Animal Testing uh, for the promotion and further development of non-animal approaches to tackle COVID-19 related healthcare issues. So, Professor Hartung, uh, I want to invite you to take the floor. Please unmute your microphone and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Anja. Um, it's exciting that I have more often the opportunity to speak in the European Parliament since I left the European Commission 11 years ago, and uh, I'm a regular here in this group. Um, I hope you give me the opportunity to share my screen because I have some slides prepared for you, um, which I would like to share. Um, good morning here from Baltimore. Uh, we had chatted already in the beginning. It's four o'clock here, and um, it is, uh, but there's only one global time, which is now and then. Now, it doesn't allow me to share still. Is there?
So at the moment, I have no possibility to share my, my, uh, my, my slides. It says host disabled and then this, this uh, screen sharing. Well, we are looking for a solution for this. Uh, just to... Okay, I can, I can start uh, so that we don't waste any time. So we do radio instead. Um, it's not quite true, you see at least me speaking. Okay, something is happening. So, okay, it seems to work now. Um, technology is good if it works. Here we go. So now you should be able to see our screen. Um, I'm talking here from Baltimore, um, the Dr. Johns Hopkins, the Bloomberg School of Public Health, which is at the moment in the news uh, very much. Uh, it was the first school of public health 104 years ago, um, and it's still the leading school. Um, we have established some 10 years ago exactly, um, also European branch, so I'm a professor at the University of Constance and we have this uh, nice bridge and with a policy program towards the European Parliament led by Francois Bisquet, we are regularly talking to you and trying to inform on both sides of the Atlantic about the uh, possibilities to do something. We are normally not good in social distancing, this is our group and a lot of the things I'm presenting is done by the group. Uh, at the moment, we are working out of the lockdown, as everybody does. Um, this is the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, I have now had for 11 years, leaving the commission, the opportunity to work here in environmental health and also microbiology and immunology, which comes very handy at this moment, as you can imagine. Um, one of the take-home messages from this 11 years of experience is that certainly Europe, from my perspective, lags behind in public health, there's no such institution like ours. Um, 2,300 students and 500 million budget, um, that's uh, unheard of, um, 700 professors, so one to three um, on distribution. But you also need the right government to take advantage of this, and this is one of the reasons um, to talk to you uh, to make things better than some things are handled uh, here at the moment. The first thing I would like to say is that from my point of view, Everything which happened since December is a tremendous success story. Um, if you see that we had the first cases in December recognized, the, days, the WHO was informed at, at the last day of last year. Already in, on the 10th of January, there was the first PCR published outside of China. Uh, the genome was evaluated of the virus in, on the 11th of January. We had tests in January already, uh, which are still in use. Uh, we have since March a couple of antibody tests against this and um, give even the first emergency use authorizations for a drug which seems to shorten the time of course. If you compare this for example to HIV, a disease where still 38 million people are living infected and 1.7 million added every year, uh, it took from 1981 the first cases until the end of the last century in order to come to the first uh, really meaningful treatments. And this should be a lesson for us, how long it normally takes to tackle any important type of infection. So there's a medical challenge at the moment. We want drugs and vaccines, and we want them fast. And this is at the moment the discussion of the day. Um, we have uh, summarized a lot of the, our thinking around this in this article, which was accepted yesterday. It's an editorial in archives of toxicology, and those interested in details, I'm happy to share this. A lot of this is at the moment about how can we make best use of the decade-long investment into alternative approaches for drug repurposing, for target discovery, for showing the efficacy of drugs, for vaccine development, for combination therapies, because why should this be better, any better than HIV? We would need single drugs only. Drug safety 
and then obviously the quality and batch control from of vaccines and others. Um, I'm always thinking that it's not only an ethical motivation to work on alternatives. Uh, this is an article from two years ago. Um, the most important omics is economics. Uh, we entitled this. And if you look into drugs, it is a tremendously expensive thing to develop a drug. You see here how preclinical work and clinical work have skyrocketed. In the meantime, we have to assume that it's about 2. Point billion to develop one successful drug. 95% um, fail in clinical phases uh, of development, and it takes us already years to get to these clinical phases with preclinical work. Um, at the same time, this is becoming more and more costly over time. Um, inflation corrected since the 50s, you get for $1 billion, 80-fold less than you got in the 50s. And interestingly, this industry, which is under tremendous pressure to develop something and make it still a business, is using less and less animals. Um, from 2005 and 2011 only, um, the industry use of these animals was about 40% less, 40% decrease in just um, six years. This is um, showing that despite increased investment, um, there is a trend going out of these technologies. Um, all of this is happening globally. And uh, one important learning for me personally was that the US, which has only 4.25% of the world population, is consuming 64% of the drugs under patent. Um, and they're consuming 48% of all drugs in the world. And this is the reason why the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration here, is more equal than others and everybody is looking to this market and how to get into this market. Um, this is quite tremendous. If you look into vaccines, uh, the situation is similar but a little bit different. First of all, I think it's important to understand that it takes a long time to develop a vaccine, typically between 8 and 18 years. And the average costs of these past projects were about 900 million euro. So similarly expensive, a little bit less perhaps. Um, it's a growth market, but it is one which is small and again 45% of revenue is made in the US. Um, and there's only very few companies who actually pursue this except for the small biotechs. So uh, most companies have actually moved out of this. Interestingly, Europe dominates the vaccine world market with 80% of doses produced and 80% of these vaccines are actually exported, contributing to the European surplus in, in trade um, quite, uh, quite uh, strongly. Um, however, there is problems and pharmaceutical companies have good reason to move out of, um, out of the vaccine market. Um, it is not a very attractive business if you're not highly specialized and if you're not living, want to live with very small profit margins. Um, you see here two prominent papers who analyzed this in the last decade. Uh, one said that the average um, development timeline is about 10.7 years and the chance of a market entry is only 6%. So really it's not uh, terribly uh, in interesting. You see here years to approval for a variety of vaccines from varicella to rotavirus, and uh, these are not very encouraging timelines. Um, this all has to do also with the use of animals, because vaccine is one of the biggest users of animals. Um, a decade ago, about 15% of all animals did go into vaccine quality control. Um, this compares to about 10% which we used for toxicology, the thing we are typically talking about when about uh, talking about alternatives. And what is quite interesting to the slight decrease in success we have seen with the new statistics, and this is an article where we analyzed this in more detail, um, quality control, especially batch safety and potency testing, was one of the contributors to actually going down dramatically. Um, when I was heading the European Center for Validation of Alternative Methods, I had half a person working on this topic. And here we have saved probably half a million um, of animals um, with the variety of activities compared to essentially no change in testing uh, requirements for toxicology. So this is something which is certainly still open for a lot of improvement. So vaccine batch control is one of the most impressive areas of success of alternative methods. This includes 
couple of activities which were prominently featured also uh, in the work on alternative methods. The next take home message I would like to give is that cell culture of today is not the cell culture people might think of. Um, cell culture you might have seen in university, um, these were petri dishes, these were cell culture flasks with some cells which looked like pen fried eggs sunny side up in a pen. Um, this has changed over the last 20 years to something which is becoming more and more organotypic, uh, something which is becoming more organ-like. And this includes the 3D cultures, the tissues and organs on chip, and is moving at the moment towards humans on chip. On the right, you see two workshop reports we did develop in this area, which are summarizing very nicely the state of the art. Both are available in our open access journal, Altex, for free. Also, the second one in press is already available as a pre. -thing. So what are the type of models which are now lending themselves to COVID research? Uh, first of all, you will think of lung, because that's the, that's the area um, where we are working on. Two models are very prominently commercially available. They can be cultured to up to a year. You see the epithetics and the MATEC models, the European and the US model. Uh, which are really reproducing um, the human airways quite nicely, can be maintained. You see uh, here the complex structure, which is very much like what you, you know from textbooks about how a human lung should look like. And both of these models are being used. These are two articles already shared as preprints uh, on SARS research taking place by infecting these type of models. It's quite interesting that um, in these types of crisis, uh, everybody moves to open access, moves to early sharing, um, exactly what the EU has been pushing for. And I think this is a very, very strong indicator that this is the future of how we should do scientific work. This is an organ on ship model, which is, um, was a science article in 2010 by Don Ingwer's group at WIS in Harvard. And you see here how this is actually known now moving into a dynamically uh, briefing type of model, uh, which is really simulating a type of lung. And there's nice uh, videos available about this model. And again, uh, this model already uh, led to pre-publication um, on use in um, COVID-19 and infections. And I know of several studies on the way. Um, uh, two of these, uh, um, of these more sophisticated models, which then have been developed are already uh, on the way into BSL-3 facilities. Um, the advances towards three-dimensional organoids uh, for all organs is incredible. Uh, the protocols are mushrooming. Um, we ourselves have prominently um, developed a brain model. We were not the first group, the third group actually, to develop a mini brain, an organoid, a ball of cells from stem cells, originally from skin of humans. But we were the first to mass produce them uh, in a standardized way, thousands of these mini brains uh, within, within a week. And uh, they show some brain functionality. These neurons are electrophysiologically talking to each other. Um, they show myelination and others. Already in 2018, we published that this model, for example, allows virus infections. Um, this is a paper on dengue and Zika virus. We have done HIV in the meantime. We have done um, uh, infections with JC virus. And obviously, we're now working on SARS-2 um, COVID-19. Um, it is interesting that 36% of the patients in Wuhan showed neurological symptoms. And there have been cases of virus encephalitis described. Other coronaviruses are known to infect the brain. And um, unpublished, we showed in our model last week only that we have the critical receptor for entry of the virus into the brain. And um, if this talk was next week, I probably would have the data as the infections are taking place while we are talking. And it will be very interesting since this is a model also of brain development to see whether this is affecting the brain development. Um, we have published on this model and EPA is sponsoring us for this model for brain neurodevelopmental problems. So we hope that we can identify this. Uh, best case, there's no effect on brain development, but we don't know. Uh, and the children are not born yet uh, of women infected. So we don't know actually whether there is any impact on brain development in the future as the sensitive months are the first two. 
the technologies are moving forward. Um, it's are moving forward to multi-organ models, hopefully at some point to human on a chip. Uh, this is worked by Tissues in Berlin, uh, one of our cooperating partners who have up to four organs on a chip in, in their standard models. Um, very interesting technologies. This is uh, a technology here from, uh, from the Harvard Wyss Institute again. Their um, human on chip has up to 10 organs uh, and they are co-culturing these. And two of these devices are at the moment coming into the highest level of security areas to work with uh, COVID-19 sponsored by DARPA. So you see the various chips they put together, liver, gut, kidney and others in order to make this happen. Um, alternative methods are more than just organotypy cultures. Um, there's at the moment computational methods, there's high throughput, there's multi-omics technologies, high content. I don't have the time to discuss them. In our article we did to some extent. These are disruptive technologies. They are making a change. They are now showing their f f that they were very important investments into the future. Uh, so let me close with a few um, concluding remarks. Um, I think that first of all, the medical challenge of COVID-19 prevention and treatment illustrates the shortcomings of animal-based development and the opportunities of new technologies even more. Um, we see that it is that in order to speed up, in order to reposition quickly to do safety assessments in a timely manner to move first in humans, these methods are lending themselves to do something. Um, from my personal assessment, um, Europe clearly leads in regulation, um, but the US leads in some of the regulatory sciences. This is why we need the collaboration globally, and that's why our center tries to be a little lubricant to make this happen a bit faster. The alternative methods are developed on both sides. In the EU, more for animal welfare reasons, on the US, more for technological reasons, but um, these are enormous advances. Um, the investment into, uh, into these organs on chip type of technologies are, are close to half a billion dollar in the meantime. So they're not small compared to the investments the EU is taking. Um, and it's important that we are knowing about what each other is doing. So they are key opportunity to accelerate now drug and vaccine development. That's my strong belief. So alternative methods are enabling technologies. They allow us to do things which we often cannot do at all in these, um, in these animal models. And I think, um, as Victor Hugo said, nothing is as strong as an idea whose time has come. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Thomas, for this presentation and all your uh, take-home messages. Um, Reineke, do we have some questions from the audience for Pro uh, Professor Hartung? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Anja, uh, I would like to uh, say to all the um, MEPs who are uh, attending, please let us know if you want to come in, if you want to uh, grab the microphone and ask uh, Professor Hartung a question. But we also have um, a question from uh, the online uh, audience. Um, Professor Hartung, um, you said in the beginning of your speech that uh, you believe that the uh, EU lags behind in terms of public health. Um, what do you believe uh, uh, the EU could do more? So do you believe that sufficient uh, funds are being allocated also to uh, human relevant uh, models, uh, non-animal models? Um, or do you believe that the EU uh, could do more in this respect as uh, billions of uh, euros are being uh, allocated at this very moment? I mean, uh, you will never hear from a scientist there's enough money. <laughs> so don't expect this from me. Um, it is all about um, how much money you want to put into something. Um, if it is about alternative approaches, uh, I think we have seen very nicely that in the few years which I had a very strong budget from the EU um, working, uh, working in this field, we made tremendous progress. More than 20 OECD test guidelines resulted from just seven years of, of work with a relatively small group of people. And uh, draining this has led to um, a, de a deceleration in this, for example. If you talk about public health, I'm just noticing um, there is no in university of this scale 
for public health. And it's a good reason why you, everybody refers at the moment to the Johns Hopkins data, because they were prepared for exactly doing this. They're giving the advice, but this type of advice is followed is then a political instrument. And um, the basic idea in, of Bill Welch 104 years ago, when he created this school of public health was that you should, physicians who are making money by treating patients should not be the ones to prevent the disease. That's the idea of public health, to separate these two. I think it's still a strong one. And one of the lessons learned is that I think strong public health advising policymakers also, um, so at the interface between science and policy is a very important instrument. And it is not made use of enough here. And um, I think uh, Europe could strengthen this infrastructure quite, uh, quite, uh, quite nicely. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas. And uh, as you will be well, well aware of, there is a lot of discussion at the moment uh, about the importance of uh, strengthening the EU's health uh, policy. Um, and uh, we have um, an uh, MEP who would like to come in, Eleonora Evi. Could you unmute, your, um, unmute yourself and ask your question? Okay, thank you and good morning, everybody. Thanks a lot for this uh, presentation. I would like to ask uh, a, a question. Um, as we know uh, from 2020 Commission's report uh, on the protection of animals used for scientific purposes, that the evaluation and authorization of projects involving animals uh, are not always sound processes and that research uh, involving animals still takes place uh, when other methods are available, as the ones you have shown uh, today. Uh, the question is, how can we improve the focus of the collaborative efforts on the COVID-19 to make sure that the robustly assess uh, the scientific and technical merits and the ethical aspects of any proposed research before they receive the funding? I also would like to point out that we, as an MEP, we sent out a letter to the uh, commissioner, uh, health commissioner, uh, health commissioner uh, Kiriakides and uh, Gabriel, and also to the EMA uh, uh, agency, uh, pointing out exactly the need to uh, basically boost and encourage the adoption of new approaches and when feasible, uh, uh, straight uh, uh, to human vaccine and drug trials. Uh, as we all have, uh, have the, um, um, I mean, as there are a lot of alternatives uh, uh, out there uh, that are not used. Uh, we, re we received a reply from the EMA and EMA um, actually uh, replied us that they are making significant contributions toward the elimination of uh, repetitious and unnecessary animal testing within the EU. But still, they, uh, of course, uh, uh, underline that there are certain types of data that can, that can and should only be generated by means of animal studies. And uh, in, in this case, then uh, revealing and confirming the same approaches, the same paradigm, I would, I would, I would say. Uh, but they also saying that they're trying to make step forward on, for example, uh, the advices to developers to leverage knowledge accumulated with platform technology to accelerate the development of uh, COVID-19 vaccine um, made upon the existing toxicology and clinical data obtained from the medicines used uh, using uh, the same platform without uh, the need to repeat certain studies. So, uh, sorry for being very lengthy, but just to say that um, there seems to be same business as usual approach and how can we boost and how can we uh, make some step forward in the direction you are telling us. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I know your letter and uh, I would like to compliment uh, for this because I think it addresses a lot of important points. I think there's a lot of um, goodwill um, everywhere. And there's also a lot of lip service everywhere, uh, but the practice is disappointing. Um, my own claim to fame is a pyrogen test, for example, uh, an assay which has been using a decade ago about 170,000 rabbits per year uh, in, uh, to be replaced in, in Europe. And it took me now 25 years to see this decline to 
reason, more reasonable numbers, but it's still not abandoned. And the reason for this is that they've always been doing it like this. The system is so resistant to this change. So it is refreshing to see how everybody's at this very moment moving to with these new technologies and are applying them because when they really, when it really counts, they suddenly are uh, lending themselves to, to be used. And this is something we should find instruments for. We need to enforce that if there is a method available, it has to be used. And Europe stops sh short, short here because they accept that people say, yeah, but there's still an important market where I have to deliver the animal test. And for this reason, I do the animal test and we are continuing doing it. If we would force to use the alternative method in Europe, independent of what others are asking for, we would create the data, we would create the experiences and the market pressures to actually move other important areas. This is not taking place. And I think we should ask ourselves, why can we suddenly use for important decision taking um, these new methodologies for something which is life-threatening like, uh, like the coronavirus if it was not possible for decades to use the very same methodologies for, uh, in, other, in other instances? Thank you very much, Thomas. And uh, with those uh, strong words and a very clear uh, message, uh, we need to move on, unfortunately. Um, there um, are a, bit, a couple of more questions uh, in the chat. Uh, we hope to come uh, back to you uh, later. Uh, but now, Anja, it's time to introduce our second uh, speaker. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Thomas, uh, for your uh, very enlightening presentation. Yeah, please send me emails. I'm happy to answer any question. Uh, oh, wonderful. Fly. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, thank you, Reineke. Uh, I'm glad to present uh, now our second speaker uh, of this panel, uh, Professor uh, Peter Himstra. He is head of the Laboratory for Respiratory Cell Biology and Immunology at the Leiden University in the Netherlands. Uh, Professor Himstra will pre uh, present a summary of animal models uh, for COVID-19, including their limitations, uh, the opportunities, the challenges of using non-animal cell culture models uh, to study COVID-19 lung disease. Uh, Professor Himstra, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And now if I can share my screen. Um, let me see, I have to get it to, so can you s see my screen at the moment? Yes. And do you see my presentation? Also, yes. And do you see the full screen now? No, not yet. Not yet. Um, okay. If I do it like this. Yes. Now? Okay. Okay. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. So I'm new to this uh, to this uh, forum. Uh, so I'm uh, at a clinical department, uh, Department of Pulmonology at the Leiden University Medical Center, where I'm the head of the of the research lab. And uh, so uh, we are trying to use non-animal approaches uh, to study uh, lung diseases, and of course also uh, uh, moved into uh, the COVID-19 uh, research with our models in collaborations, for instance, with our uh, virology department, who are really experts in, in coronaviruses. Uh, so if we um, trying to advance my screen, but it, yeah, here it is. Um, so if we uh, if we see, um, you see my full screen, or do you still see the? small one. Okay, sorry. Um, so what do we aim to, to model in, in, these, uh, in these culture models uh, uh, regarding uh, COVID-19? Uh, of course, it uh, starts with the infection of, of the upper airways and leads to transmission of the virus and uh, spread to the lower airways. That's something you want to, uh, to model. And of course, in, in, in some people, this results in the development of severe COVID-19 research uh, uh, disease with alveolar inflammation, injury, cardiovascular effects, thrombosis, involvement of other organs. That's also something you want to remodel. And 
what you also want to model in, in, in your research is the, the possible long-term consequences of COVID-19, because you may have all heard about uh, uh, the fact that, uh, especially based also on the uh, SARS 2013 epidemic, uh, we're concerned about the development of structural alterations in especially the lungs that may cause uh, 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 severe um, adverse health effects. So that's also something you want to model. So you want to look at the immune response, you want to uh, study inflammation and tissue injury, coagulation, blood vessel involvement, and the impairment of, of organ functions. So that's quite a bit of things that you want to mo uh, model in your systems. So if we look at animal models, of course, they have uh, uh, the advantage that they allow studying the complex pathogenesis and multi-organ involvement of COVID-19. And uh, they are being used uh, in, in vaccine development, evaluating antiviral drugs and development of novel drugs to treat not only the acute, but also the long-term consequences of COVID-19. But of course, there's important limitations. For instance, uh, a widely used animal is of course the mouse. And if you look at the mouse ACE2, which is uh, considered as an important receptor for uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19, uh, that is really different in mice and it doesn't bind the virus very well. So if you want to use mice, you need to use transgenic mice. Uh, but on the other hand, ferrets and rhesus macaque monkeys, for instance, are infected. An, another limitation is the development of severe viral pneumonia with alveolar injuries or so peripheral lung injury and acute respiratory distress like uh, uh, features. That is also uh, uh, something that needs to be modeled and it is certainly not present in, in all of the uh, models that are being used uh, today. And a third important limitation of the animal models is, of course, that we know if we look at the development of severe COVID-19 disease, there's important risk factors such as age and obesity. And those also need to be taken into account if you want to model a severe COVID-19 uh, uh, research, which is associated, of course, with a lot of uh, morbidity and, uh, and mortality. And then if you want, if you look at what you want to model and simply look at uh, the, uh, the mucosa of the airway where the infection occurs. So this, the airways are lined with a layer of cells called epithelial cells, and they are the cells that are uh, initially infected, and uh, they're different along the respiratory tract. And there's a lot of involvement and interaction with all sorts of other cells, especially from the immune system, that are important in defending against the virus. So. Uh, this is something you need to consider when you construct a model, of course, that uh, those different components are present. So what you want to do in an in vitro, so in a culture model, you want to create a relevant microenvironment because mimicking the whole body at the moment is not feasible. I'll come back to the body on chip that uh, also Thomas uh, alluded to uh, earlier. So what you need to do is you need to match the cellular elements of this microenvironment with the research questions that you want to answer. So this is very essential in looking at alternative models. What is your research question and what is the best model to study that? So we need to discuss which models are available and some of those have already been discussed uh, by, uh, by Thomas and, and which are the gaps uh, in, uh, and, and, and what, what improvements are needed in those models. So in our lab, we uh, mainly focus on uh, the epithelial cells. As I say, they line the respiratory tract and uh, we prefer to work with uh, uh, cells from, uh, from patients, for, with human cells. And uh, uh, as Thomas also uh, explained, it started by uh, uh, simple cultures on the, on the left-hand side of the slide. Uh, now uh, we are um, uh, doing a lot of air liquid interface cultures and the commercial systems that uh, Thomas mentioned uh, are also uh, uh, available. Uh, we construct these uh, ourselves. Um, the lung and chip that I'll come back to and of course the organoid model. And in addition, you can think of organ culture. Uh, so you can cut lung tissue into small pieces and culture that and you can also take uh, lungs that are not suitable for transplantation and do ex vivo uh, research on those. So there's plenty of possibilities to study, for instance, the role of those epithelial cells, which are very uh, important in, uh, in COVID-19.
Um, so you can make model a little bit more complex, and this is something that we have done in co-culture studies. So uh, we've uh, uh, cultured the epithelial cells at the air-liquid interface, so exposed to air, just like in a normal body, and incubated them together with macrophages to look at uh, the interaction between the macrophages as an immune cell and the epithelial cell. So you can make the model a little bit more complex to mimic the body a little bit more. So what you can also do is to, to use the organ on chip that uh, uh, Thomas talked about. So what you do in those models, actually, you introduce an additional level of complexity. So uh, uh, you can see on the right-hand side, a still image of uh, the movie that Thomas uh, showed. Uh, so you culture your epithelial cells on, uh, on a membrane, and you culture your, your endothelial cells, so the blood vessel cells also over there. And then what you can do is underneath you flow your medium with all the goodies for your cells, just like a blood channel, right? And on top of the cells, you flow air, just like in the lung. And the advantage of this system, of course, is that you have a continuous supply of uh, fresh uh, uh, nutrients and removal of waste products. Some of the models, uh, like the uh, system that we used, uh, uh, which is a commercial system from Emulate, which is a spin-off of the Wies Institute, also has the ability to apply stretch. So what you can do is you can stretch the membrane on which the cells are growing in a repetitive way. So that allows you to sort of mimic the effects of breathing. Because of course, in a breathing lung, you have, a, especially in, 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 the, uh, in the air sacs, the alveoli, you have a continuous expansion and going back to normal again uh, of, your, of your cells. And that also has an effect on your cells. So that's something you want to model. So there's various of these organ on chip platforms are available, each with their specific strengths and weaknesses. But it's, uh, we have the system also uh, in our lab and we also work uh, with it. And uh, the, of course, any system has limitations. You have to have dedicated personnel that really knows how to work with it. And you have to have the available funds. And um, there's already uh, some attempts to link these different chips, organ chips together into uh, what you can call a very, very primitive version of a body on chip, in which you can have a lung chip uh, combined with a gut chip and with channels, you can combine those. So something which is produced in the lung chip can be transferred to the lung chip and the other way around. So you can look at interactions, but this is very, still very much in a primitive uh, stage. Uh, the organoids are an additional uh, very interesting uh, topic that also uh, Thomas alluded to. So these are cultured structures that consist of multiple uh, cell types that have some of the function of the organ. And what is important is that the cells are uh, grouped and spatially organized in a way which is similar to an organ. So this is how we culture uh, so-called air sacs shown over here at the bottom. And uh, this is also a very viable uh, model uh, to, uh, to study the disease. And the use of such organoids was recently published also in a science paper by the group of Hans Klevers at the Hubert Institute in the Netherlands. And so they're really pioneering also in, in organoid uh, research. And they demonstrated that not only airway organoids, but also organoids derived from the intestine. Uh, that those can also be infected not only with the new uh, uh, coronavirus or the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, causing uh, COVID-19, but also the SARS-CoV virus that caused the 2013 uh, epidemic. So that's an important use of, uh, of such, uh, such models. So in conclusion, there's a lot of development at the moment in, in new and innovative culture models that will be very suitable and are already very suitable for study important aspects of COVID-19 research. But of course, there's a lot of gaps to be filled. So there's uh, limitations to be overcome. And I've listed some of those over here. For instance, uh, the first one is the use and the access to cells. So still there's quite a bit of research using cell lines that are tumor cell lines or immortal cell lines that are not really like the cells that we have in our body. And also we need to think, do we want to use based on the research question, cells from the lung or cells from the blood? Blood is very easily accessible, but of course the lung is more difficult uh, to get. 
but it offers the opportunity to not only use those cells from, uh, uh, from humans uh, in, an, in an untransformed way, but also to study the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the cells from the patient. So we are collecting at the moment uh, cells from COVID-19 patients from the lung and trying to set up culture models to use those. In addition, there's an important development, the human-induced uh, pluripotent uh, uh, stem cells uh, that you can generate from any cell in the body in a non-invasive way. And also those cells we can differentiate in our lab and various labs around the world to the various cell types in the lung that are relevant to COVID-19 research. The second limitation is that many models are composed of only a single or two cell types. So for instance, I showed you the example of epithelial cells and macrophages, but more tailor-made models composed of various cell types uh, are available and can be constructed, but you have to uh, have the research question you want to address leading the type of model you want to construct. The third limitation is that you want to mimic the effects of air and blood flow and the mechanics of breathing. Well, this is now included in these organ on chip models. So that has an advantage. Um, uh, another one is that you want to study cell-cell interactions in a tissue structure related environment. And the organoids that uh, Thomas and I talked about offer such a possibility. And finally, uh, you want to study the interaction between organs and in future that may be uh, possible in a more realistic way using the, the body on chip. So this demonstrates that there's really a lot of different models available and all the models that we have are complementary, right? So from uh, relatively simple to more complex models, each have their different uh, advantages and disadvantages. And some models maybe, uh, some research questions can be better addressed in an organoid system, other can be better addressed in an organ on chip model, and others can be uh, achieved by studying, for instance, the air liquid interface uh, uh, culture of the epithelial cells that I talked about and that we are widely using at the moment with our uh, virology de department to look at uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so that is sort of the summary of uh, what I wanted to, to give. And of course, I'm very happy to uh, answer questions. Well, thank you very much, Professor Himstra, for this excellent presentation. Um, Reineke, over to you uh, for the questions from the audience and our uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anja and Professor Himstra, for this uh, fascinating uh, speech. We have uh, one uh, question from the audience and also one of the uh, panelists who would like to uh, come in. So let us uh, firstly uh, pose to you the question from the audience. Um, Professor Himstra, um, you outlined several of uh, the gaps in terms of um, non-animal research. Uh, what would you need to overcome uh, these gaps uh, from the EU, for example, but also from other regulators? Um, um, would that mean more subsidies or would you need more collaboration between the scientific uh, community? So what would you need um, as to be uh, uh, reliant on non-animal models when we are confronted, uh, hopefully not, but uh, if that was to happen with the next pandemic? Yeah, I think, I think collaboration is essential and there's a lot of collaboration already ongoing uh, uh, in Europe and across the world. So that is very important, uh, of course, Grants are also very important and it's important to keep considering the possibilities of having separate grants for animal free research because the limitations that you have in an animal model versus an animal free model are different and so that may avoid in a, a part of a way also comparisons that between grant applications that are not fully comparable. So that is certainly important. And if you talk about implementation, uh, uh, talking about regulatory uh, authorities, I think it, it remains very important that researchers and regulatory uh, uh, authorities keep talking to each other about what type of validation is needed before you introduce a model. Because uh, um, as Thomas uh, demonstrated, uh, there is some standardization, uh, there's commercial models available, but yet there's quite a bit of variability in approaches to the details of the culture models. So that 
for that reason, it is very important for the regulatory authorities to keep talking about uh, uh, what needs to be done to get it introduced uh, and, and, and define a common strategy to achieve that introduction. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this um, reply. We have a follow-up question uh, to this. Um, someone from the audience wonders if you believe that all the researchers who are now um, developing medicines or vaccines are making use of the existing uh, non-animal models that are already in place and that you uh, also outlined in your presentation. Is there a common understanding and a common use of those alternatives? Um, I think I think there's common understanding uh, uh, of those alternatives, but uh, what people do also depends sort of of what is available in their own laboratory or in their environment. So that is why I think it's also very important to invest in like core facilities within institutes to join forces and try to bundle knowledge on the introduction of these really more complex models. And uh, so that is a way to also increase the availability of these uh, models to researchers around the world. And I think uh, people that are working with the animal models, they are aware uh, of, uh, of these alternatives and they are also using them in combination very often uh, with animal models. But, but what is important to make it more accessible and to find ways to increase that accessibility of these really complex models. I mean, because that has to be realized. I mean, many of the models uh, require uh, uh, dedicated personnel and they uh, also require TLC because tender loving care is needed to culture your cells. <laughs> Um, that's uh, uh, very interesting uh, to hear. Uh, so here the EU could play an important role also to facilitate uh, researchers in uh, uh, facilitating that access uh, to the alternatives and hopefully also sharing uh, the results. Um, we have another panelist who would like to come in. Uh, Laura uh, Gribaldo from uh, GGRC uh, Directorate of uh, uh, URL ACFAM. Uh, Laura, you have something to share with us on uh, ACFAM's work on uh, antibodies, which also relates to this uh, topic. Uh, yes, thanks, Reineke. Thanks. Uh, I have to share a couple of things uh, very important uh, in regard to what uh, both uh, uh, Thomas and Professor Imstra just uh, mentioned uh, in their talk. Um, Thomas highlighted the, the importance of replacement in the area of vaccine testing and antibody production, which is very true. And uh, we know that uh, the, the area, these two areas are, are the ones where there is the largest, one of the largest uh, um, percentage of animal consumption. So, I mean, uh, it's, it's uh, particularly important for me uh, to mention uh, the, the great results uh, that we, we, we achieved uh, the, the, last, uh, the last weeks uh, on the, with the ECBAM recommendation on the replacement uh, for animal-derived antibodies. This uh, recommendation has been mentioned also in a correspondence published in Nature just a couple of days ago. And um, this, uh, this recommendation says that, uh, based, of course, uh, taking into consideration the ESAC opinion, so the independent peer review of our um, expert scientists on the scientific validity. Uh, this recommendation is, uh, as I said, uh, says that uh, the animal should no longer be used for the development and production of antibodies for research, regulatory, diagnostic, and therapeutic applications. So, and, and this directive is stated that should be respected in all the AU countries and should not the EU countries should no longer authorize the production and development of antibodies through animal immunization, where these methods are, uh, are available. And uh, we know that, uh, that these methods are available. And, and uh, especially um, in this time, uh, it, it's not a coincidence that the fully human antibodies uh, uh, with blocking activity against the coronavirus have been generated through the phage display technology in this time and now are being explored for the therapeutic and diagnostic potential and for serological tests. So apart from the quality, reliability, safety of these antibodies producing using non-animal techniques, uh, this can save a considerable amount of precious time. 
And uh, so I think, uh, I think it's extremely important uh, uh, that now we have this uh, uh, recommendation available. And uh, with this recommendation and this uh, strong evidence-based uh, announcement, uh, uh, we have to promote uh, um, in the research community, in the regulatory communities, uh, um, to, the, to the ethical bodies and so on, we have to strongly recommend to promote um, the application and the implementation of this directive. Um, and this is, uh, is this, is really close to, to, the, to the field we are discussing about. And the second comment is on the IMSTRATO uh, presentation. And um, it was nice to see uh, this presentation because uh, it's, uh, it's an area close to the, uh, to the study we did uh, in, uh, on non-animal models in respiratory uh, research that ECMAM just uh, completed. And uh, we are going to publish very soon, I hope before uh, the end of June. And um, we did a collection on inventory of, uh, of many of the methods mentioned in the talk before and even other, other methods. And uh, we strongly agree with uh, Professor Imstra that uh, there is a need of create a platform for knowledge sharing about these methods. And um, also to discuss with the scientists because here we cannot impose or superimpose any criteria for validation of, uh, of these methods in research, but we have to discuss openly and agree with the scientists uh, which criteria we can eventually apply to prioritize in terms of standardization and, and um, yeah, and, and, and technical uh, use of these methods with the scientists, which one are the most uh, advanced and uh, promising models. That's it. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, for these uh, important uh, additions. And I suggest that also after this uh, meeting, uh, we see how we can take things uh, forward. Uh, Axfam's work is uh, very important uh, in this uh, respect, uh, of course. Um, we have uh, another question from uh, MEP Niels uh, Pubelsang. Uh, Niels, uh, would you like to come in and pose your last question to Professor Heemstra, please? Yes, please. So uh, thank you for, for the uh, very informative presentations. I would like to ask about um, duplications or uh, the efforts to avoid duplications. Um, how do you think that um, the cooperation, international cooperation that we have today um, is effective in avoiding duplications when we have made one experiment on, on animals well, the best thing is to avoid having experiments on, on animals, but when they have been done, they should not be duplicated if, uh, if not absolutely necessary, of course. So uh, how do you think we can avoid that? Do we have the systems today to, 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 to prevent that? Or do we need to uh, have better systems? And if so, uh, which kind of systems? Thank you. Okay, um, well, of course, uh, duplication in a way in science is important because uh, it's always important to to validate uh, uh, what has been found in one lab also in other labs so that's sort of a general remark but of course I mean unnecessary animal experiments I mean uh, uh, that is something of course which is uh, uh, um, uh, partly regulated by uh, the local, uh, uh, so the national uh, committees, uh, the Animal Ethics uh, Committee, they also take into account whether there's novelty involved. Uh, the journals, of course, are uh, involved. And for instance, I'm a basic science editor, um, a section editor for the European Respiratory Journal. And for instance, uh, if we uh, uh, review research that involves animal models, we really look at whether um, uh, if reviewers are asking for additional uh, animal experiments, whether that is really, really needed. So that is something we look at in a more specific way than for instance, if you would ask for additional experiments in the cell culture models. So I think there's various ways in which uh, unnecessary duplication is uh, uh, prevented. But of course, there's a lot of parallel research. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot going on. Uh, people are doing things at the same time. Um, and you can argue, for instance, as Thomas is saying that um, 
quick publication like on bioarchives that we see now a lot booming in, in this COVID-19 area may partly help to prevent that. But what we need to consider all the time is that research that is published on such platforms has not been peer reviewed. So it can also sometimes be misleading because the quality was not sufficient or whatever. So I think there's various ways in which we uh, can prevent unnecessary duplication, especially of animal experiments. But uh, totally pre total prevention at the moment is, uh, is difficult. But I think people are aware at different levels that it makes a difference if you duplicate an animal experiment than if you would duplicate another type of experiment. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Himstra. And there is a lot of uh, food for thought uh, for us in terms of also the role of uh, the EU. I, I believe that global and European uh, coordination remains to be uh, a big uh, challenge. Um, but this uh, crisis also provides us with the opportunity to rethink uh, the systems and, and tools that are in place and see how we can support the scientific community to make uh, faster progress on non-animal uh, approaches. Um, so thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Anya, uh, over to you again to introduce our last speaker for today. Well, thank you, Reineke. Uh, yes, our, our last speaker for uh, today is um, uh, Dr. Pierre Merlier, uh, uh, Executive Director of the Innovative Medicines Initiative, uh, IMI. Um, he will take us through the experience of the Innovative Med Medicines Initiative in advancing the application of the three R's, replacement, um, uh, reduction and refinement, with a high focus on non-animal approaches and the improvement of translation to clinical application. He will explain to us how this experience is being uh, applied to the calls on COVID-19. Dr. Mulia, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I, I don't think I have uh, addressed uh, this group before, so, um, but it's a, it's a real pleasure uh, to do so. Uh, I'm going to try and as well share my screen. Um, so hopefully I can do this. Um, Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, we can see it. My but slide? Yes, but we, you need to start the presentation, please. Yes, very good. Okay. Take it Perfect. away. So thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks again. Uh, so obviously, I'm going to take a uh, funder's uh, perspective uh, on this and um, I was uh, glad to hear uh, Peter talking about the, the role of the national uh, ethics uh, committees, as well as the, 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 uh, the work that's done while reviewing uh, manuscripts and, and so on. And the same is true for, uh, for funders. The funders have a role and a responsibility in this regard too. So I'll, I'll touch on that uh, as well. For those of you who do not know uh, the Innovative Medicines Initiative, it's, um, a, a public-private uh, partnership uh, which uh, ha represents a real long-term commitment from both the public through the European Commission and the private sector, the private the pharmaceutical, um, the European pharmaceutical industry uh, through FPIA. And this has been a 5 billion euro uh, initiative spanning two framework programs. And uh, as you'll see, we're in the last year of our allocation of uh, of funding um, uh, and um, we have so been funding uh, quite a few uh, different areas of research. Uh, the driver for those areas are really uh, to do with um, looking at the pre-competitive space where uh, industry partners are uh, comfortable working together uh, and then working with academic uh, groups to further uh, to further specific areas of uh, complex, usually quite complex uh, research areas where uh, people can uh, share risk uh, at, uh, this, at this uh, stage. 
Uh, we not only, of course, in our consortia, because usually we have, um, we fund large scale uh, projects. I think the average is about 30, 35 million euro. We have some a lot larger than that, uh, 180 million, 200 million, and some uh, smaller. Uh, but we're able to bring together quite large groups of stakeholders, not, including not only the, the, the great European scientists and clinicians and uh, industry players, but also uh, patient groups, uh, regulatory authorities, uh, SMEs, and, and, and so on and so forth. So all those who uh, should have a voice in uh, some of these aspects. Um, and when we fund, when we evaluate uh, proposals, um, the, uh, we have a dedicated ethics uh, review of each project, which is separate from the scientific review. Uh, and uh, there, the use of animals, um, you know, clinical trial design, preclinical studies are looked at very carefully. And it's at that point where we uh, hope that we raise the bar. Uh, we know we can do a lot more. Uh, and uh, in order for um, a, a check uh, to be uh, to be made right up, up front uh, in, to in the evaluation uh, process, so I think uh, both uh, Peter and Thomas uh, really uh, gave a very good overview of uh, how the science and technology can drive um the uh the 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 revolution if you like in, in terms of the use of animals and the using the three r's uh the three r principles and the the reduction refinement and replacement uh, then has been um made uh good uh, because of this advance in science and technology and i think uh, they've all talked about diff the different types of models whether they be uh, human in vitro models, uh, animal in vitro models using in silico models in predictive toxicology, for example. Now, more recently, the use of artificial intelligence and then the relevance of, of the animal models if their animals are being used. Uh, standardization is a, is a big thing. Uh, instead of people trying to compare apples and oranges, uh, why don't we come together and standardize models that each will uh, will uh, be able to validate much easier in, uh, in different uh, settings. Uh, increasing the relevance to the human situation, because we know that a number of uh, models for different disease settings are, are not that relevant, and these need to be replaced. And uh, obviously, then moving to lower phylogenetic levels of modeling. So this means that instead of using uh, warm-blooded uh, mammals, one could use, per, in certain instances, of course, uh, worms, insects, or zebrafish, uh, or, or other, uh, other uh, species. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do very quickly, and I'm not going to go into the science uh, behind this, but just to illustrate those different um, types of uh, model systems that are being used, in uh, IMI funded uh, projects. Uh, this one is EU AIMS, it's an, on autism uh, research, uh, a very large scale uh, project where um, the uh, pluripotent stem cells uh, uh, are being used uh, to uh, look at specific uh, differentiation of, of neurons. Uh, and this is obviously avoiding quite a lot of uh, animal uh, testing. Here's another one. Uh, it's, uh, we do a lot in uh, drug safety um, because drug safety is a, is, is a great topic for a public-private partnership whereby uh, the industry players are very interested in understanding the safety of their own, uh, their own drugs and their drugs in, in development. Uh, and of course, uh, this is a great balance with the public health need to understand mechanisms around drug safety. And a lot of drug safety uh, issues and toxicology issues have been traditionally a huge user of animal uh, testing. So a big shift is happening uh, right now. Uh, and we have uh, a lot of uh, projects. One of these is called MIP Dili, uh, looking at liver uh, toxicity and really shifting from, uh, in, vit uh, from in vivo testing to in, vivo, uh, to in vitro uh, testing. Uh, based on uh, human uh, pathophysiology uh, models. So this is uh, certainly the trend, and this includes um, 
then work on uh, infectious disease. So this one is looking at uh, the uh, detection of uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, where uh, uh, once again, uh, a lot of um, uh, new designs in uh, pharmacometric, uh, pharmacometric uh, methods, inclu including miniaturization, has been used. Uh, so that's a project called uh, Predict uh, TB. Uh, and then uh, sticking to uh, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, here we've, uh, the, this, uh, the, the key word here is standardization, where the consortium players uh, that were, are involved in combined this project uh, have really uh, tried to standardize their own models uh, in order to be able to compare apples with apples. Uh, and uh, once again, reducing uh, the multiplicity of different uh, animal models and choosing the ones that will be most relevant uh, for the particular case. And this harmonization or standardization, I think, is also driving uh, the reduction of uh, the use of uh, animals. And in my last uh, non-COVID uh, example, um, uh, this is a, a new uh, cell line, a human cell line uh, uh, for use in uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, where uh, I think it was the first one in the world uh, that was able to uh, be used in uh, looking at stresses in, um, in the, uh, in the uh, human pancreatic islet, beta islet cell. So this was uh, so these are the, 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 the trends, and I wanted to give you a little bit of a, an overview uh, in the uh, non-COVID uh, uh, arena, because this is a, uh, this is a big part of uh, what we do and what we try and uh, stress when we evaluate uh, projects. And, um, uh, uh, and uh, once again, the science and technology is driving that. I'm going to skip this slide because there are just, just uh, other examples. I, I know the slides will be made available to you afterwards, uh, and you can have a look at the IMI website to, uh, if you're interested in any particular area. Uh, one of uh, these is preclinical uh, pediatric cancer work, um, which is uh, really uh, looking at relevance, uh, the relevance of animal models uh, too. So the more recent developments and science and technology, as you know, doesn't stand still. So we have now new projects coming on board in uh, one on digital pathology, uh, where machine learning and, and AI can enhance the interpretation of uh, pathology in images. And the engineering of human tissue using CRISPR technology, for example. You've heard from Thomas and um, uh, Peter before uh, looking uh, at organoids. Uh, and uh, then lots in the advanced imaging for brain uh, related uh, research and all of this of course moving to uh, the human uh, as uh, as as the model so in the relevance for covid-19 then uh, obviously um, uh, we need new screening technologies and you've heard a lot about uh, those from thomas and uh, and peter uh, you can see the rush uh, to try whether we're talking about uh, um, uh, diagnostics, uh, therapy, or vaccines, a, a real rush to get into humans as quickly as possible, as human will be the, the test target, and there may not be um, uh, highly relevant uh, animal models for, for a lot of uh, these interventions, uh, so that's being used. But we need to be very careful here, uh, I would say, especially with uh, vaccine-related research, because it's very going to be very difficult not to test at least something in in uh, rodent models or other models before uh, going into human, and I think we just need to uh, be uh, very careful there in terms of uh, the safety of our uh, of our uh, clinical trial uh, subjects. Uh, and uh, I think the human cell line uh, piece and human cells and, and the organoids that, that Peter talked about, I think are going to be really important whether we're looking at new, new therapies, whether these are supposed to be blocking the, the, the viral receptor um, that is uh, unknown uh, or new agents that can block uh, viral replication uh, inside the cell. 
<clears throat> I think uh, the human uh, cell lines will be very uh, important to that. We have actually a project um, uh, on zoonotic uh, infections uh, that was this is an um, started in 2015 and uh, by chance uh, so well before uh, this particular uh, coronavirus um, uh, pandemic, um, this project, uh, which uh, brings together many uh, different uh, groups from the public and private sector, including regulator, re regulatory bodies, uh, decided to look at more um, going away from uh, animals and creating platforms. And we already heard from one of the questions from the um, a panel member. Uh, in terms of uh, antibody platforms or vaccine antigen uh, pl platforms that can be uh, uh, antigen discovery, of course, can be can be uh, driven through uh, looking at human uh, human neutralizing antibodies and how the pro those profiles map to antigens, and then one can obviously make those antigens very very quickly. And this group, this is a 30 million euro project, and and as I say, five years uh, old. Uh, and they chose three uh, viruses, uh, Rift Valley fever, uh, Smallenberg virus, and MERS, uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which is, of course, a coronavirus. And because of that, and uh, now there are a whole load of tools available in this project that can be um, used uh, and are being used, uh, both in the public and the private sectors, to advance uh, our thinking, uh, and, and including they have a humanized uh, monoclonal antibody against uh, MERS that cross neutralizes with uh, COVID-19. So um, uh, uh, these are the kind of projects I think that we, we need to look at very carefully in, and this is all to do with pandemic uh, preparedness. And we probably need to do as a, as a, uh, a, a, in a global way, we need to do more of, of this. So as you all know, um, uh, IMI, uh, put out a, a call, um, uh, call 21. Uh, this was a very rapid call and we had a huge response. Um, uh, so we're only able to fund uh, eight projects. They've been pro provisionally selected from 144 submitted. The total request for funding was over 700 million euros. So that's the, uh, that's the amount of stuff that's uh, that's uh, going on here. So it's a phenomenal amount of uh, research that's going on. We will only be able to fund 117 million euro of, uh, uh, of that. And this comes from 72 million from the European Commission uh, that comes through our uh, budget and 45 million from industry and other, other partners who are joining uh, in these, uh, these projects. So of these eight, five are on diagnostics, three are on new therapeutics. And what's striking uh, here is that there's a high degree of technology convergence. So looking especially in, I would say, the, um, well, in both types of projects, because we have uh, projects uh, on the diagnostic and the therapeutic uh, uh, areas where you see this uh, high, a lot of high throughput, a lot of robotics, a lot of engineering, a lot of uh, chemistry uh, going into uh, to this, these multidisciplinary uh, themes. Uh, and of course, some projects are going to be repurposing uh, molecules that are already in the clinic or at, uh, in fact on the market for different, um, uh, different indications. So there's going to be very interesting where we can go directly into MAN to, uh, to look at that. And then others are focused uh, on more innovative, uh, longer term approaches uh, for uh, the coronaviruses because this is probably the not, not the last time we will have a, a coronavirus problem uh, on, on this planet. So I'm going to finish uh, there uh, and uh, thank you for your, uh, for your time and your attention. Well, thank you very much, Pierre, for your presentation and also for all the work you have done uh, on this topic uh, so far and, and will do in the future. Um, Reineke, uh, are there any questions from uh, the audience or from our panelists uh, for uh, Dr. Mullia. Uh, thank you, Anja. And yes, we have uh, some questions uh, that came up uh, during the presentation. Uh, firstly, I would like to see if uh, MEP uh, Tilly Max is still with us because she also asked to take the floor. Uh, Tilly, you would like to come in? 
I'm not sure if she's still with us. So we move to a question, um, the audience uh, to Dr. Moulin. Um, and uh, this person asked, uh, cross-disciplinarity keeps coming up as a great difficulty in biomedical sciences in general, which plays a role in the low translatability of results into clinical practice. So what useful advice would you give to other funders and research teams that want to increase the clinical impact and the uptake of non-animal methods of the projects they fund or uh, carry out? Um, Dr. Merlin, would you like to respond to that, please? Sure. Thank you very much. And it's an excellent uh, question. And we do try. And um, so we kind of position ourselves um, before the regulatory process really kicks in, although, uh, and this is my point, uh, we absolutely need to have regulators in the teams uh, so that they can give advice, uh, not only give advice, but also change their own uh, processes and, and so on. And I think Peter talked about, you know, the, uh, the validation uh, that's, uh, that goes on that is going to be the requirement from the regulatory standpoint and those and and this can uh, appear to be a slow process uh, because how do you validate that what in, is happening in an in in vitro process uh, can be, can give you this the the same result or it is the same result as if you were doing animal experiments and then based on that be able to uh, clear the path to human uh, testing, so it's a it's a big responsibility, as you can um, imagine, and so I, I think having those groups at the same time uh, around the same table uh, with the researchers and the industrialists and so on, I think has is is one of the keys uh, to uh, being suc successful in this uh, in this area. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Merlin, for this uh, answer. Um, we have two MEPs who would like to come in still. Um, firstly, uh, Tilly Metz. Um, I think you are with us now. Can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, sorry, I had the phone. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation. I have a, a very general question because we see there is a lot that has uh, been done on, on human-based um, research also to study COVID-19 on cells, etc. But uh, it has quite little visibility compared to uh, all concerned with animal experimentation. So is there a possibility that we can make it more visible and increasing really the visibility of uh, non-animal approaches uh, to build trust, more trust in these matters? Because uh, one of you, uh, I think it was Professor Himstar, really also mentioned that uh, on making research on animal is not uh, transferable, he speak about them, the mice have to be uh, genetically modified, etc. So how can you make it more visible that non-animal approaches are even more efficient and that there is a lot of work already done there? And then I have a second question, but I think Niels uh, already mentioned it. How is the state of play right now by sharing experiences and uh, among the, the laboratories uh, and among the research especially concerning COVID-19 where I think it's very important that we share what we know right now about uh, vaccines etc. Is there really a systematic share between or at least uh, to public research centers or how do you see this uh, share of, uh, of results and uh, experimentation right now? So this good question. Thank you very much again. Uh, thank you, uh, Telly. Um, and indeed, I think your last question was uh, uh, addressed, uh, but maybe Dr. Moulin also wants to uh, say a bit uh, about how you know, we could create better uh, accessibility. Uh, Dr. Moulin, would you like to react to Telly and perhaps uh, Professor Himstra also afterwards to uh, Telly's first question? Yes, I'll, I'll give a more general uh, answer, and I'm sure Peter will be able to um, give more specific uh, answers. So in, uh, indeed, um, in our call, we uh, have insisted that people need to look at the global picture of this. And we're going during, uh, right now, we're, we're uh, you know, in the, the, the part of the process where the 
uh, the consortium uh, get together and uh, they're going to sign a, their consortium agreement and then we sign a grant uh, agreement. And during that time, we're going to make sure that there's um, connectivity with other, other, uh, uh, other groups uh, where that's relevant so that we begin to uh, have uh, join up some dots here. Uh, because I think that this is, people have talked a lot about global coordination of uh, COVID research, and there is so much going on that it, this is a huge challenge. And I don't think there's one body that can do this. I know there's a, there's a group called Glopid R that's run through the WHO, which is very active in this, in this area, but there's no way we're going to be able to coordinate very carefully everything that's going on because the, the volume is so uh, high. Uh, so, but I, so I think um, that we're going to try and uh, join up dots where, where we feel these are relevant. Uh, and then um, obviously we're talking to other funders because once again, I think the funders have a, an important role uh, to play here. So we are talking to our um, the Wellcome Trust and, and other philanthropic uh, uh, organizations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, and then other national funders uh, as well, of course. And uh, we're embedded in the European system, so um, uh, it's obvious that we're, we're going to be, we're very much part of the coordinated response uh, from the European Commission. So, but I think that that is, um, you know, there's so much work to do on that. Uh, and I think uh, I, 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 I think um, uh, we'll be we'll be at that for for a while. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Merlin. And we do not underestimate uh, the challenge of global uh, coordination for sure. Um, a quick comment from you, uh, Peter, about also the promotion of the existing non-animal uh, methods. Do you think there is room for improvement there? Uh, yes, I think I think there's room for improvement. Um, first of all, I, I think at the moment related to COVID-19, of course, a lot uh, of the public attention is is focused on on vaccine development, and there the outcome of an animal experiment is sort of easy to explain, right? And uh, so that, that that's a little bit of bias, I think. Uh, uh, and and some of the readouts in in the uh, culture models are a little bit more difficult to explain. So it's up to us as researchers also to take the responsibility and to talk in public lectures about alternative uh, for animal models and, and, and uh, how important they are. And then if you look at sort of collaboration internationally, I, I think uh, uh, it's, it's very important. So I talked about uh, the core facilities, which I think uh, are very important. And at the Leiden University Medical Center, we're setting up such a core facility for animal free uh, research at the moment. So I think those initiatives are, are important. Training programs are very important. We have very often, we have uh, people on fellowships from the European Respiratory Society coming for three months to our lab to learn techniques. I had a postdoc, for instance, who worked on a Marie Curie fellowship to work for one year at Emulate, the company, the organ on chip company in, in in Boston and one year in our lab. And so those training programs by the EU and by other uh, organizations are very also important to train people and, and, and let people see uh, uh, the, the possibilities associated with these new techniques. Uh, thank you. Um, we have time for a last uh, uh, question and uh, hopefully uh, a last uh, comment from the panelists. Um, Jutte Guteland, um, are you still with us? And yes. Ah, you. hello. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the panelists. Um, uh, I, um, I listened to, um, in, the, in the last presentation was really interesting about the technology development and how uh, more effective tools regarding the drug security is improving the situation. Um, but I wonder, because sometimes when we talk about this in, in the past, at least, it was about um, how to get uh, people to, to stop using the animal test and, and uh, use alternatives. And then it feels like the, the model, the, the standard is the animal testing. And it's very difficult to get people to change this because the laboratorium is um, standardized to use the animal test and 
um, all everyone is trained to use it and if you would like to be published in a paper it's important that you show the animal test and there is a skepticism towards the new technology so how can we in the European Parliament improve the shift and help the technology to take this paradigm shift uh, during this corona crisis is it possible to by founding um, uh, in the EU use the EU money to to give um, the alternative tests the the attention to make sure that we would like to use the um, the alternatives or the new technology uh, and no animal testing with this money we would like to see the new the new way so we we shift from from talking about the animal testing to talk about the new technologies and say that this is where we want the money to go could that be a way for politics to shift everything uh, what do you think thanks so much uh Yita. um this is a very important uh, question how can the eu uh, use this crisis to really shift uh, paradigms um, Thomas Hartung, you're still with us and you uh, would like to come in here. Yeah, with, uh, two very quick comments. Um, first of all, I would like to compliment IMI for uh, what they're doing. It's a fantastic program. The only thing which I'm missing is international participation. It's really a pity that international groups cannot part, be part of this. And uh, COVID is a nice example that this is a worldwide problem and not something which should be done just within Europe. The second part, um, Europe might not yet have a, um, a mandate for health, but I think it has a natural mandate for public health, um, which comes simply out of the uh, out of the role uh, the EU has to play. And I think this could be the really the the entry door for um, a more coordinated approach. And what I'm noticing from my now transatlantic perspective is very much that in the US we have. A system which is very much driven by the uh, federal agencies. It's driven by the FDA, by the CDC. Um, as you can see at the moment, it's driven by the NIH with Antonio Fauci being the face of, uh, of, of, of most of this. And that's what we are lacking in Europe. We have administrative agencies. We do not have agencies which are setting the agenda for research and uh, such responses. And I think that's where something should start uh, in order to play really the role Europe deserves in preventing and reacting to this type of crisis. Thank you very much, Thomas, for those uh, closing uh, remarks. Um, there are still uh, several questions in the chat box, but I'm very sorry, we need to uh, wrap up this meeting, uh, Anya. Um, because uh, we are already uh, running over uh, time. Um, this is not the last uh, discussion about this topic. It uh, really gave us a lot of food for thought. So Anya, how are we going to take this uh, important topic forward? Yes, thank you, Reineke. Well, we, we heard during this meeting uh, uh, very uh, important scientific uh, techniques and methods that can um, reduce the use of animals in research significantly. Um, and especially uh, uh, also in research aimed at understanding and preventing the treating uh, and treating of the coronavirus. Uh, Professor Hartung has shown us how the strategic investments in non-animal uh, and human relevant approaches uh, needs to be boosted in order to improve the effectiveness uh, on the research efforts in translating it into uh, uh, clinical practice. We also heard about the, uh, these innovative approaches that can include uh, enhanced in vitro, uh, in silico, but also uh, ex vivo methods uh, in close combination with clinical data from real patients and how important it is to prioritize uh, the standardization uh, of these testing and disease models to better understand the applications and limitations of each method. Uh, we heard from Professor Himstra about the limitations of methods that are uh, currently use animals. 
and how important it is to, to clarify these limitations on, on animal-based methods to help build trust in the human-based approaches, as well as to avoid the use of thousands of animals uh, in research that will likely lead to a blind alley. Uh, Dr. Mullien told us about the importance of multidisciplinarity in science, especially for projects um, uh, that are prioritized by clinical need. We heard about the importance of scientific leadership uh, in thinking strategically about translation into clinical practice. And finally, we understand that open science is a major driver to, not, uh, to ensure not only a speedier dissemination uh, of the best three R practices and uptake of new advanced research approaches, uh, but also to avoid the duplication of tests and experiments, which is also uh, still a problem in today's use of animals in research and testing. Um, so, ensuring that up-to-date overview uh, of models, data sets and results are available and disseminated to the whole uh, scientific community is a very important element in, uh, for any strategy that can lead to significant reduction or even better, to full replacement of animals used for scientific purposes. The Animal Welfare Intergroup will prepare a recommendation based on knowledge uh, shared by uh, our guests today and send them to Commissioners uh, Maria Gabriel and Stella Kiriakidis. We hope that this will lead to a set of, uh, of criteria uh, for calls on COVID-19 and also future calls that can improve the effectiveness of every EU research investment. Uh, we also are setting up a working group uh, to continue work in this area to guarantee that in this political term, the European Commission puts forward a concrete strategy to phase out the use of animals in research and testing. So, I would finally like to remind you that the next Animal Welfare Intergroup meeting uh, will take place on Thursday, 16th of June, from 10 to 11.30. On the, uh, and the focus will be on the farm to fork and biodiversity strategies. I would like to thank again our guests for their excellent presentations and for their uh, good work on this topic. Thanks to all my colleagues uh, who participated today, and I hope to see you all again next meeting. Stay safe, everyone. Bye.